G'day viewers, my name is Graham Stevenson and I'd like to invite you to come on a journey of creativity and learning and adventure through the series Colour in Your Life. There's an artist in every family throughout the world and lots of times there's an artist deep down inside all of us as well. So grab your kids, your brothers, your sisters, your aunties, uncles and mums and dads and come and see how some of the best artists do what they do. Okay, folks, well, we are in West Bath in Maine, in the United States today. And we're going to be working with a very talented, award-winning watercolour artist, Evelyn Dumphy. Great to meet you, Gail. Thank you very much. Now, Evelyn's an amazing lady. She has done so many things for so many other groups, apart from art, that you, that you obviously love. But she's also an activist for land conservation and also helps out a number of children in hunger programs across the world, even in Zambia one stage as well. But your art career basically started around about 2000. Well, I, it was a long culmination of uh, uh, many years of ever since I was a little kid thinking I was an artist and announcing to my mother that I was going to be an artist and travel the world. Uh -huh. And it took, it was a, you know, really a circuitous route yeah. to get to that. But I had finally made a decision to start painting and once I started, I was all in. After having a successful exhibit in 2000, um, I decided that was the moment I was done with the corporate world and I was oh, uh, going to paint. And, and that's exactly what you've done. I mean, you do workshops in France, Cuba, Spain, Italy, I mean, USA, Canada, mm -hmm. literally all over the world these days. And your workshops are always full up. I mean, people love to be with you. Uh, you're a charming woman for a start, so that's, I suppose that helps, doesn't it? So, but uh, today, I mean, you're, you're, you've got some techniques that when I walked into your studio, I just sort of said, what are you doing here? And we're going to discuss this as, as we get into the, the painting, but there's something that's fascinating about the watercolour board that we've actually got here. And we're going to be doing a scene of katahdin. Yeah. Uh, I got that right, I think. You yeah. did, you did. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and, and the beautiful scenery that's actually around Maine and the areas that you paint, I mean, it really this is a glorious state. But I'm going to step out a shot and I'm going to let Evelyn take over and tell you some really fantastic techniques. I mean, some stuff that I've never seen, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right, Evelyn, before we even start, when I walked in, I looked at this and I thought it was canvas. It's not, it's watercolour paper and you've wet it and actually nailed it down or stapled it down to a canvas stretcher. Yes. How long have you been doing that for? Oh, probably um, 18 years. You can see that it dries literally like a drum, so it's a perfectly flat surface for painting. It's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. So, well, let's make a start on this. Now, from what you tell me is you've got to turn it over and actually wet the back before yes. we start with the colour. So let's, let's, yeah. let's have a look at that. That's right. What I'm going to do actually is pour water on the back. Okay. And I want the water to be distributed evenly. Wow. All over the paper. You don't want any little skips because if you do, then the paint dries differently. Actually, I could put even more water than that on. That's amazing. Which usually makes people gasp. Um, yes. But just to cover every inch of the paper um, and you can, I mean just knowing that that's watercolor paper and not canvas is the amazing uh, part. Yes and it's just 140 pound paper yeah okay and then I don't leave the water on here very long uh -huh. uh, just until it feels cool to the back of my hand okay and that's about right and I'm just going to pour this back into the jar right back into my Water and that's, and jar. That's, that's ashes as well, is that that's correct? That's arches, 140 pound paper. 140 pound right. ashes. Right? And now I'm ready to go, and a little bit will probably flow off of here. Wow, that's amazing. I've just never seen that before. Well, it, it has at least three advantages. One being that the paper is absolutely flat, yeah. and the other uh, that the values dry just exactly the way you want them because the water is not floating on the top, it's in the paper. Yeah, that's so amazing. It's uh, my favorite surface for painting. So I'm going to start and okay. uh, 
I like to mix up a bit of a, a working palette before I start. And I know that you work with M. Graham paints as well. Yes, M. Graham is one of my favorite brands. They're very juicy and they don't dry, yep. uh, dry up the way some other uh, pigments do. Yes, they um, are lovely. All right, I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm actually using granulating pigments for this because I wanted to illustrate or demonstrate the uh, the ability on this paper to create texture uh, just with the paint and the water and not using any, you know, not using salt or anything like that. And because of the characteristics of these two paints, the rose and the blue, mm -hmm. it separates on the paper. You can sense that the paint glides on a little easier with that with that wet oh, pack. It goes on just like cream. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say enough about the quality of this paper. And I did learn to do this from a, a main artist named Michael Vermatt, who's a wonderful main artist. Mm -hmm. And then I learned, uh, after looking it up, that um, English artists 200 years ago, what the watercolors were stretching their paper because they were originally oil painters, and so it came naturally to them to uh, to stretch their paper. Wow! So um, if you can see the the uh, the way the the way the paint goes on, it's there's no no effort at all. It just flows off your brush. Now the piece that you're painting today, Katahdin, has really had a great influence on your work over the years. Yes, very much so. I would say deciding to focus on Katahdin was a turning point for me. It led to opportunities that I probably never would have had and it was a place I loved to begin with and having the opportunity to go there and paint you know, uh, in all seasons for several years has been just a, a really fantastic. And with all the traveling that you've done, you've been up to the Arctic as well, even painted some of the uh, the icebergs up there, which would be pretty fascinating. You've been, in in general, a, an adventurous woman, canoeing up near the uh, Penobscot. That's become our new national monument, that uh, land that we were paddling over to that day, it's, which is huge. We're thrilled to death about that here in Maine. What I'm doing now is adding a little extra value to the edge of the mountain where it meets the the shoulder, which is often is shows up as being green. This uh, in the shadow, um, more violet. But I really like to bring in the uh, the violets and the blues because I want to carry the color from the mountain forward into the uh, shoulders, which are green. And then as I continue, I'll bring that into the foreground plane as well because I have learned that over many, 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 many experiments and trying is that carrying the color from one plane into another uh, really unifies the painting. I learned that if I just let clear water work with me, just trickle a little clear water down, mm -hmm. I can create the look of the crevices, the, you know, the convex and concave shapes on the mountain without having to lift particularly or add, um, add more pigment. Yeah. And so just letting water work for you, which I think with watercolor is absolutely you know, the way to go. I can let these little tiny trickles come down and honestly it creates the look of the mountain with very little effort. Uh, learning how to do this was just a matter of, you know, <laughs> of trial and error and sitting in front of the mountain and trying to figure out how to make it look like this. And then I could come in and add a little shadow on the side just to create the, you know, uh, complete the, the effect. But it, truly it is this surface um, that makes this possible. So one of the things that I um, decided when I was composing this painting was that I would like to have the edge of the mountain be broken uh, so that uh, it just added a level of atmosphere. And there was more than one way to do this. Sometimes I paint the sky around the mist rising and paint the mountain around it. But because I'm painting on this paper today, Again, just by letting clear water work on the surface, it doesn't look overworked, it doesn't get muddy. 
I can just let that uh, the water help me create that impression of the uh, mist rising over the mountain. And I can also just touch it gently to stop the water from going too far. And so that worked uh, very well with that. And again, I, I think a lot of the success of that is because of having the, uh, the you know, the water on the back mm -hmm. of the painting. So what I really want to do is just leave this edge very soft so that I can come back into it um, when the Katahdin dries a little bit mm -hmm. and pick up that soft edge. Because I always tell my students, never leave an edge that you can't live without, that you can't live with, because mm -hmm. inevitably it will dry uh, in little, little marks, little points that you really don't want. So I'm adding a tiny bit more green to the shoulder of the mountain and a little bit of violet. And uh, with the greens, I always like to put some violets uh, because it's the complement. And what you've done today for us is actually prepared a couple of pieces of the same subject, of yes. course. So um, yeah. we can, particularly when it comes yes. to um, uh, working with the fact that you've got watercolors and you've got to have things that dry. Right, yes. Um, yeah. So we've got a couple of pieces that we can work on today. Right. Yes, the, that, that made it uh, made sense to do because mm -hmm. it would take quite a long time to do a finish, yeah. especially when you have to let things dry in between. Of course. So we can ready, we can move on to the next stage. All right, Evelyn, while well, you've put a second piece up that you've worked on as well, um, so where do we go from here? What, what, what can you tell us? Well, first of all, I lifted off um, a little bit more mist on the mountain mm -hmm. and I, I did it in the same way as I did it the, the first time. It's to put water down on that wash and let it settle in a little bit and then just let the clear water move the paint and I touched it a bit with a uh, towel so that it would lift up. So now what I, I'd like to do is put uh, just a pale Naples wash behind the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, it won't really show up, but I love that, that, that just warm blush behind. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that and then I'll paint the mountain in uh, graded washes. Turning it around to... Yeah, it makes sense to turn it around and just do a... Again, I don't want it to be yellow. Uh, there's a little hair there, but let it dry, it'll come up. And I like Naples yellow because it isn't bright. Yes. All of the other yellows, even the lightest values, when they're, they're still very, very bright, I find. So Naples just gives it sort of a, it's an indiscernible little bit of a glow of color. So and I'm just softening the edges as we go along. And this this will not dry lighter, so if it's too yellow, which this really is, I'm going to quickly just wash some of it away. Because painting on this uh, stretch paper really means that my values are going to dry just the way I put them down. So I'll just grade that off into nothing here, and then come back with a wash of two or three blues. So now I'll turn this around and I'm going to use um, manganese blue uh, for the first wash and then I'll follow that with cobalt. So I, I like to layer the blues because a blue sky has more body. Now that's a word I use talking with speaking with students often too because sometimes a painting is great as far as it goes but it's too thin if that makes sense. It's just as if you need a little more punch. So this is a great brush because it carries a lot of water and a lot of pigment across the paper without making any lines. And now I'm going to uh, add a glaze of cobalt blue. And normally with watercolor, traditionally, you let your washes dry in between. Because I paint outdoors so much, I really have gotten in the habit of doing what I call wet glazing because um, it's seamless. It just uh, flows really nicely right on top of the other 
other blue wash and I'm just going to come just gradually right across and then tip my paper so that the uh, the wash will settle down closer to the mountain. You've got another piece here called Vanishing Point and it's, it looks like you've done similar technique in the sky there and then all of a sudden all those beautiful purples for the snow. This looks amazing. Thank you. That was uh, after a wonderful January day at Katahdin Lake. So I think that's going to be enough of a value for the sky. Okay. And always wipe off the edges of your painting otherwise it could run back in and make blossoms. Okay, so we'll let that sit and just tap out that little bit of mist again. And it's time to do the water and the reflections. I think it's amazing that that, uh, that piece of paper hasn't buckled because it's been stretched and then... And there's so much water yeah. and pigment on this. And it taped down and hasn't buckled one nope, little bit. No, nope. And some of your pieces are really vibrant as well. You've got three here of some flowers. You've got one called Beaver Lodge and then another one called pitcher plant, mm -hmm. uh, which is a carnivorous plant, of course. And then the um, yellow lady slippers as well. And there's that wonderful three-dimensional feeling that you get with it because of the blurred out backgrounds and then the detail in the front. Mm -hmm. they, look, they look amazing. Yeah, the, that was a great revelation to look under my feet when I was painting the mountain and suddenly see that there's all this beauty, right? underneath my feet literally that I wasn't appreciating. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> One of the things I really, really like to do is to add compliments when I'm painting greens uh, so that things don't just get, you know, green, green or greenest. So I always drop in uh, a violet, which I will mix with ultramarine blue. And in this case, a little permanent rose and quinacridone burnt orange which is a Daniel Smith color it's also uh, just a beautiful addition to green because um, it's the complement of the violet and it just adds interest. Well, not only do you do fantastic landscapes but you also do still lifes and portraiture and uh, you've got a couple of pictures here of your beautiful twin red-headed <laughs> granddaughters one's called Flower Power <laughs> She's got a pair of boxing gloves on. I think that's, that's a great <laughs> picture. And then Golden Girl, which is uh, a little bit more expressionist, but both really, really pretty paintings. <laughs> Thank you. That was, it's sort of a personal project that I have. Uh, uh, just the idea of painting young women on the cusp of leaving, leaving their safe homes and going out in the world. And mm -hmm. they are both now safely out into the world. And uh, I have, I have other grandchildren, other granddaughters too, and uh, they're, but they're unfortunately they're not close enough that I really have the reference material. But uh -huh. it's something I just I really enjoy doing. And your uh, your still lives as well. You've got a piece called Exuberance of Spring. I just love that because it's got such an abstract form about it. Mm -hmm. And then Kyoto Shadows, obviously from your time in Japan. That painting was in the New England Signature Members a watercolor show in Boston this last spring. And uh, Japan has also been a very big influence as far as the art. One of the paintings that I did called Snow Falling on Katahdin uh, was not inspired by Japan. Uh, it was, it's Katahdin and I did it in the studio. People who see it always say that is so Japanese. It was just one of those things. It just, that's the way it turned out. Now you're also a signature member of a number of very well-known watercolor societies as well. The New England Watercolor Society yeah. being one of them. New England Watercolor Society is, is one of the oldest in the country and it's a really good, mm -hmm. very good organization. They have, uh, they've had wonderful members for a long, long time. Uh, John Singer Sargent was a member there you go. of the New England Watercolor Society. So it's a... Uh, I don't get much more prestigious than that. No, and it's close, I mean, it's two hours away, which is really nice. Now, so. if somebody would like to come to your workshops, specifically the workshops in Maine, which is a beautiful, beautiful area. I mean, the state is just glorious. With the mountains and the lakes and the shorelines and the boats, and it's just, it's just incredible. Uh, they can go and see you at your website. What's mm -hmm. that address? EvelynDunphy.com. I'll have uh, 2020 workshops will be um, on my website. 
of all the beautiful places I go, I, mean, I often think it's, it's hard to find any place more beautiful than Maine. When it's a little bit of, we have a little bit of everything, and uh, it's just a, a great thrill to teach in Maine. In the process of your artistic adventures, you actually teamed up with a gentleman and wrote some uh, children's books as well, and you illustrated them. And one was Possum Playing Possum and Wisheroos Swisheroos. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. That illustrated the books. They are delightful books as well. Well, thank you. Uh, Bill Sivitz is the author, and uh, he he is a very generous soul, and his his big thing with this is it, that he wants to uh, make sure that all every child has a book and so every time someone buys a hard copy of one of his books a paperback copy is sent to any child organization that he that that owner that that buyer specifies so we've shipped books all over the place hospitals and libraries and nursery schools and even to the food bank in Bath and Brunswick here so it's a very very nice thing that he does wonderful I can really think that it's pretty much done. Well done. Absolutely well, well done. Thank you. And um, we've had a fantastic day. I mean, you've taught me some things I didn't know. I, I can guarantee you that much. <laughs> but it's an absolute pleasure to be in your studio. Evelyn, you're a delightful human being. And uh, thank you so much for everything that you do for everybody else as well. It's been well, I, it's been great having, having you here. And uh, <clears throat> I think what you do for artists is incredible. And artists um, all over the world obviously are recognizing that and um, may that continue. Thank so you. I'm thrilled to be part of Color in Your Life. Thank you very much. <laughs>